Okay. Hey, good morning again, everybody. Uh, Pastor Jeff here. Uh, it's a rainy, snowy Sunday morning, and it's the third Sunday that we haven't been together. Uh, let me begin by saying I miss uh, interaction with each of you in a physical way. Uh, thank you for taking the advice and the direction of our leaders uh, at the state of Minnesota and uh, appreciate everybody taking this as seriously as we can. Obviously these are difficult and ominous days in many ways and uh, scary days in many ways. Um, but I, I want to begin by also uh, starting where I ended with Julian of Norwich two Sundays ago. All will be well, all will be well, in all manner of things it shall be well. And that comes out in the narrative that I'm going to share with you this morning. It's the last Sunday of Lent, this 40-day period leading up to our celebration of Easter. It's a very appropriate text for that. Um, and it is also a very appropriate uh, text or story or narrative for the days in which we are living right now. And so my prayer is that um, we will be encouraged uh, through the reading and, and, and uh, study, I guess, uh, of this text, at least uh, in some regards, and that uh, you will be uh, strengthened um, in your conviction uh, that all will be well. And so what I'd like to do is read to you uh, John chapter 11, um, and pause along the way at different spots and, and share some ideas with you. And then, as has been my custom these three Sundays, introduce you to um, a woman theologian or mystic or activist. Uh, this one happens to be all three of those, a Renaissance woman, pre-Renaissance woman, uh, a pre-Renaissance Renaissance woman is what I'm trying to say. Um, by the name of Hildegard of Bingen. And she uh, lived in the 11th century, uh, a theologian, a mystic, an artist, a poet, an architect, a doctor, a botanist, a playwright, a uh, composer, uh, an amazing uh, Christian woman uh, that has helped shape uh, Christian theology and the church all these years later. And so let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, uh, I want to set the stage just a titch for you before I read chapter 11. In chapter 10, uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and um, as a result of his teachings in chapter 10 and his declaration of his identity, he is accused of blasphemy, and the Judean authorities um, uh, pick up stones to stone him. And uh, his, clearly at this point in the narrative, his life is uh, in danger, and uh, he escapes uh, out into and across the Jordan to the area where John the Baptist had been baptizing, and there he is uh, as chapter 11 uh, begins. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. We talked about them last week. And um, that's another reason I wanted to tie in this, this story with you as well. Also remember that the name Bethany, the, the village of Mary and Martha, means house of the poor. Uh, and it's outside Jerusalem. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And one of the things that um, crossed my mind and, and as I read this and, and, and studied the text this morning, uh, for this morning, um, is someone uh, talked about take notice of the verbs in the text. And here is a verb that Jesus loved Lazarus. Now, what 
chapter 10 ended with that I didn't read to you was Jesus says, you can call me a blasphemer if you like. Uh, you can raise your stones and want to stone me. But all I do is what the Father does. And so here it is. Here's the answer, the first answer, or the first verb that God does. God loves. And Jesus loves Lazarus. And Jesus loves you. And another really interesting point in this is that the name Lazarus means God helps. God helps because God loves. God does not bring pandemic. God loves in the midst of pandemic. God does not bring pandemic. God helps in the midst of pandemic, as do God's people, as do good human beings, as do all those that are fighting uh, to keep us safe, those on the front line, the doctors, the nurses, the first responders, Please let us uh, honor them and keep them in our prayers. When he had heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is, for the God, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. In other words, in this story, the sickness of Lazarus is an occasion by which the glory of God might be experienced and seen. And that's true today as well, that through your efforts and through the help of others, through our own efforts to love one another, to be uh, the shield of one another, to support one another in times of need and isolation and division, um, all of this allows for the possibility that the glory of God might be seen. And you, you, you've heard stories and uh, the glory of God is being seen, even and especially in these times. Um, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There is the idea again. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. It's an interesting nuance. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, in, I'm going to read you what this text says, and then I want to try to make a very important point for you. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? If you have a Bible that says the Jews tried to stone you, you should, you should get a marker and, and just black that word out, the Jews. It, it was not the people that were trying to stone Jesus. It's not the people that crucified Jesus. It's not the people that turned on Jesus. It was the Judean authorities, the authorities in the capital city of Judea, which was Jerusalem. So please, there's nothing anti-Semitic in this narrative. Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours a day a daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees this he sees by this the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. Very shortly, as the story goes on, these same Judean authorities will lead a armed group of uh, temple guardians um, to arrest Jesus at night in the garden. Because they have no light in them, they walk by the night. Um, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is not dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with Jesus. Now here's another word I want you to cross out with your pen if it says believe, 
And I want you to exchange that for the word trust. So that you may trust. For your sake, I am glad I was not there. So that you may come to believe, come to trust. And then, isn't this interesting, this, this, this story about Thomas? Isn't it fascinating that we know Thomas only as the one who has doubts? But here in this story, in John 11, Thomas is the one who is willing to go with Jesus into the face of danger and willing to die with Jesus. So please, um, at the end of Lent here, begin, if you have not already, begin to understand that Jesus is going to be arrested and murdered and um, that it's dangerous for Jesus in what he's doing, uh, that he doesn't go to Jerusalem to die for your sins. He goes in solidarity. Um, so uh, let's, let's continue to read. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to con comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will keep, keep you whatever you ask, or God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, who trusts in me, will live even though he or she dies. And whoever lives and believes and trusts, trusts in me, will never die. Do you believe this? What he's saying is here, they will never be separated. We all die. It's not about physical death here. And this is where Hildegard uh, uh, of Bingen, her, one of her ideas or one of the things she is known for was emphasizing um, this concept of uh, verditas, a Latin term meaning vitality. And, and she associated that with this nuance of greening. And as I look out my yard today, the new rain and the warmth uh, things are beginning to green. And isn't that a hopeful sign for us, especially now? Um, the greening of life is what Jesus is talking about here. The, the Greek term is zoe. It means life, not biologically, not bio, but life in terms of vitality. I am the force, the cause, the power behind life. And um, that's what spirituality is about, that's what Christian discipleship is about, is finding ways to tap in to the resurrection life that Jesus talks about here. This is exactly what Hildegard of Debingen, Hildegard de Bingen uh, was referencing in her, in her writings and in her music, in, in, her, in her poetry, in the composing of her songs. Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. This is the declaration of Peter. Here is a woman declaring Jesus as the Christ. It's the same thing that the Catholic Church says, by virtue of Peter's confession, he became the rock on which the church is built. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, they replied. Jesus began to weep. 
Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Nowhere do I remember ever reading a narrative in the Bible, or certainly not in the ministry of, of the New Testament, in the ministry of Christ, did he keep anyone from dying. Lots of people are dying. He doesn't keep people from dying. He weeps in their loss. He weeps, he mourns, and he laments. This is a part of the call of the Christian church. Not to try to fix everything, but to enter in lament and solidarity with those who have lost. Not only now in a time of pandemic, but at all times to comfort those who have lost. Now, it's an interesting nuance here in, in, in the description of Jesus' emotional response. And I, and I think this, this also kind of legitimizes the complete range of emotions that you and I are feeling these days. Confusion, um, fear, uncertainty, um, I think uncertainty is the one that probably is the one that most resonates in my soul. I'm just uncertain. I feel uncertain as to how things are going to play out. And that's, um, you know, it's all out of our control. Um, but I think this legitimizes whatever feeling, feelings you are experiencing. And what, and what, what this says, there, there's a picture behind this. There, there's a, it's a picture the, the, the root word here for Jesus is, is that he is like a wild horse snorting. He's indignant and he's angry at, uh, at the death of Lazarus. And, I, I, and he weeps. But, I, but I, don't, I don't, I might be wrong, but I don't think he's weeping because Lazarus died. You know what I think? I, I think... There's a part here where Jesus is weeping because he knows that his own days are ending. That his time with these three that he loves is coming to an end. I think he, he weeps for the now of his life. And another woman that I like to read, a blogger by the name of Debbie Thomas out of California, a uh, children and family pastor out there. I have a quote of hers I'd like to read to you. It is okay to mourn the loss of vitality, of intimacy, of longevity. It is okay to love and cherish the gift of life, here and now. And so perhaps Jesus was weeping because he knew his time was running out. I think about that. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. Was it a tomb? Or was it a womb? For he soon calls for Lazarus to come out. And after he calls Lazarus out from the womb or the tomb, he asked those present to unbind him. And I guess I pretty much want to almost end there by saying that you and I are the ones now called to do the unbinding. That you and I are called to lend our participation in the work of helping everybody know the vitality and the greening, not only of spring, but the greening and vitality of God's Spirit within you. Um, we have a call to unbind one another. And what's so fascinating is that this act, this raising of Lazarus, is what actually led 
to the binding of Jesus. Because very shortly, he will be arrested and bound and beaten and tortured and ultimately murdered by the state. This is the last story that we should read and to study and to contemplate because after this comes Palm Sunday. And here's how chapter 11 ends. This amazing, beautiful story of love, of vitality, of hope. And this is how it ends. 1153. From that day on, they decided to kill Jesus. Judean authorities, not the people. Brothers and sisters, now is the time to lend our vitality to one another. I've seen so much social exchange uh, via the internet and all of that, and it's fantastic. We're working to keep in touch with you. We've set up a, a fund on our website to help one another get through this time. Um, if you want to unbind by sharing your resources to those that have lost work, please do so. Please pray for the Marks and the Sarahs and, uh, and the Sheilas who are out there, nurses among us, doctors among us, doing their work. Um, God bless you until we meet again in a physical way. Know that your church prays with you and for you, that your staff loves you. All will be well. All will be well. And in all manner of things, it shall be well, because you will never be separated from the love of God.